Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part six of Going Nuclear. If you've been following the series so far, then welcome back. It's been a while, but uh, I've been doing my research. Now, you might have some ideas about how we might go about building a nuclear weapon. Today, we're going to cover the biggest roadblock, the refining of the fissile material used in the core. The main isotopes used in nuclear weapons are uranium-235 and plutonium-239, and the production of usable quantities of these materials represented the largest parts of the Manhattan Project. It takes hundreds of tons of uranium and massive industrial operations to produce enough material to make a bomb. The primary uranium processing facility was in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and the primary plutonium production facilities were in Hanford, Washington. It's worth checking out this video over at Cody's lab, showing the effort required to refine uranium ore down to less than a gram of uranium metal. And this isn't atypical of many ore refining processes, by the way. Scaling up a process like this to the industrial levels needed to produce the tons of uranium required to build a reactor needed a whole lot of specialized installations. However, the chemical refining hardware was small compared to the equipment required for the enrichment of uranium from the 0.7% uranium-235 to the 80% uranium-235 used in the weapons. The difference of three neutrons doesn't amount to much, and it's commonly stated that different isotopes of the same element are chemically identical, which isn't strictly true. But for uranium, the differences are small enough to have not been considered useful for isotope separation during the Manhattan Project. One thing that all the enrichment processors used in the Manhattan Project have in common is that they work with gases, so that each individual uranium atom is isolated from every other one, and they can move freely to be separated. Being a heavy metal, uranium has a rather high boiling point, so instead the enrichment processes would work with molecules like uranium hexafluoride. The boiling point of uranium hexafluoride is about 50 degrees centigrade, which makes it quite manageable from a thermal point of view. Also, fluorine having only one stable isotope meant that the only thing that could be different in the molecular mass was the uranium. However, squeezing all those fluorine atoms around a single uranium atom does make them much more interested in jumping off onto other reactive substances. And much of the scary fluorine-rich compounds mentioned in the book Ignition owe their existence to the fluorine chemistry experiments in the Manhattan Project. Another molecule used was uranium tetrachloride, which was less corrosive to the hardware, but all the production also generated things like phosgene gas as a side product. This was the input material to the first enrichment system used during the Manhattan Project, the calutron, which is essentially a mass spectrometer designed to electromagnetically separate a beam of uranium atoms passing through a magnetic field. The different massed isotopes get deflected by a slightly different amount, and collectors would be set up to accumulate each isotope. The first such device was constructed using the old magnet from the cyclotron at the University of California, Berkeley, hence the name Cal-U-Tron. An early test run of this calutron in January 1942 produced 2 micrograms per hour of 25% enriched uranium, and this would eventually be scaled up to 50 micrograms per hour. Industrializing this process ultimately entailed the construction of over 1,000 calutrons, and with the war on, there was actually a shortage of copper to make wires for the electromagnets. Instead, somebody came up with the bright idea to substitute silver, supplied by the US Treasury, 13.3 thousand tons of silver, or 430 million troy ounces, because the US Treasury only worked in ounces. Technically, this was a loan from one part of the US government to another, and it was supposed to be returned after the project. There are some great descriptions of the lengths they went to in their efforts to recover silver, such as ripping up and burning the floorboards of the workshops and collecting the melted silver that ran off. Ultimately, they would only lose a few kilograms. While the calutrons would contribute to the Manhattan Project, they generally wouldn't be used to enrich uranium after the war, as other methods proved to be much more cost-effective. And I should probably take a moment to explain efficiency. 
All of these enrichment processes use energy to take an input mixture and separate it into two outputs, with one being more enriched than the other. Now the calutrons are an example of an enrichment system which takes lots of power but also produces a large increase in the enrichment. Other processes might take less power but also produce a lower level of enrichment. So comparing the enrichment efficiency of these isn't simple. But scientists came up with a number called the separative work unit, which can be applied equally to all systems. Now, it's not work in the traditional physics sense. Rather, it's a measure of the energy required for a given input and output composition. And different processes can be compared by the energy requirements for each unit. unit. Usually this is measured in kilowatt hours. Now, early systems required megawatt hours per SWU. Modern efficient systems are about 100 kilowatts per unit. It takes less than 10 units to manufacture a kilogram of reactor grade uranium and it takes about 200 units to make a kilogram of weapons grade material. So calutrons prove to be exceptionally power hungry due mainly to the energy required to ionize the material. Instead, most current methods exploit the small difference in average velocities in the uranium isotopes in the gas phase. Molecules containing the lighter uranium-235 will have slightly higher velocities than those containing uranium-238. The majority of uranium enrichment during the Manhattan Project used gaseous diffusion, whereby uranium hexafluoride would be allowed to diffuse through a permeable membrane. Now Graham's law shows that the rate of diffusion is inversely proportional to the square root of the molecular mass. So on the far side of the membrane, you will have slightly more lighter uranium-235, only a tiny bit more, roughly a 0.1% change in the isotopic ratios from input to output. To enrich uranium up to weapons grade ratios requires thousands of stages arranged one after the other. The Manhattan Project also used something called thermal diffusion, and this worked on the principle where a thermal gradient in the gas will lead to the heavier molecules collecting near the cold end. The Manhattan Project used long cascades of 15 meter tall columns with a heated core and cooled outer walls. Since the warm gases tend to rise, the lower mass uranium-235 would tend to migrate upwards. After a great deal of development work, it was realized that the process would never be competitive with gaseous diffusion, and it would be the only thermal diffusion plant ever built. However, it was used as the first stage of a multi-tier enrichment process used by the Manhattan Project. Thermal diffusion would enrich natural uranium up to about 2% enrichment. That would then be fed into a gaseous diffusion plant, which would bring the uranium-235 up to about 23%. Finally, this would be fed to the calutrons, which brought the enrichment up to about 85%. All the experimental processes had been combined in a race to produce the fissile material as quickly as possible. But after the war, the focus shifted to efficiency and gaseous diffusion was the clear winner in this case. The thermal diffusion columns were shut down and the calutrons transi transitioned to isolating other isotopes. The main process building at Oak Ridge became the largest building in the world. It would be 50% larger than the Pentagon, containing almost 3,000 diffusion stages. And it wasn't the only building on site with dozens of other support systems housed in their own massive buildings. Since World War II, however, the gas centrifuge process has been developed and it has become the dominant process since it's about 50 times more energy efficient than gas diffusion. It was originally developed in the Soviet Union by German scientists and the process uses gas dynamics inside a rapidly rotating cylinder. The process actually shares a much in common with the thermal diffusion columns with the lighter isotopes migrating upwards towards the top, but the rapid rotation serves to enhance the effect of the mass difference between the isotopes. The faster rotation, the better the performance. Of course, the exact numbers are classified, but it's believed that a typical cylinder may be about 10 to 20 centimeters wide and rotating somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 times per second, generating centripetal accelerations of about 1 million G. This puts the surface velocity at supersonic speeds. But of course, the whole assembly is contained inside an evacuated casing with magnetic bearings used to eliminate friction. The tolerances required for constructing these are extremely strict. 
any imperfection is amplified by the acceleration involved. And there are stories of centrifuge systems being sabotaged by deliberate mishandling, by touching the equipment in the wrong way. There's even some evidence that the Stuxnet malware was created to attack the old Iranian nuclear program by infecting computers controlling the centrifuges used for enrichment, uranium enrichment and intentionally running the centrifuges in a manner intended to destroy them. Now, beyond all these gas processes, I was surprised to discover that a chemical process was investigated and a pilot plant was built. It turns out that in mixture with uh, different ionic oxidation states, the lighter isotope prefers to go to the more ionized uh, levels. For example, the Chemex process used uranium ions in hydrochloric acid, and so Uranium, the, the U4 plus ions would tend to more likely be uranium-235 compared to the uranium-3 plus ions. And that enabled useful enrichment after multiple passes. But the efficiency was about 375 kilowatt hours per separative work unit, which makes it a fine improvement over gas diffusion, but ultimately it could not compete with centrifuges. Laser enrichment is also a possibility. Multiple processes have been investigated since the 1970s, but the winner right now is a process called Silex, which uses tuned lasers that can preferentially excite the molecules containing one isotope over another. Now this looks like it's to be much more efficient than centrifuge systems, but there are people that argue that any improvement in efficiency is undesirable because it would make it easier for a state to enrich uranium in secret. And I feel that this is an important moment to bring up the fact that most measures to limit the development of nuclear warheads by nations revolve around limiting enrichment capabilities. Technologies which can be applied to enrich uranium are strictly monitored, which can present problems for technologies which have benign applications. The old gas diffusion plants would be huge, and building these without letting the rest of the world know is really hard. As such, technologies which improve the efficiency and shrink the scale of these processes down present a problem for those working to limit nuclear proliferation. And that is why Silex, a process developed by a private Australian company, has been declared a secret by the US government. There's been cooperation here, but it is almost unique that a foreign industrial process has been converted to a top secret by the US government. Now, to allow nations access to enriched uranium for peaceful power reactors, the IAEA has worked with existing nuclear powers to establish projects like the International Uranium Enrichment Centre in Arnkarsk, Siberia, where enrichment is handled by an existing nuclear producer with the non-producers theoretically owning an equity state in the plant, thereby giving them access to enriched uranium uh, without actually giving them the technology to enrich it. Anyway, I hope this has all been enriching. Next time we'll look in detail at how plutonium is manufactured. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.